So that was a, a little video clip about the very murky world of food fraud, something I've been engaged in, in combating for, for about 30 years now and really trying to drive innovations in science in that area. I'll, I'll come back to the fraud element in, in a little while, but what, what I wanted to talk to you about was integrity, the integrity of the global food supply system. And I think before I do that, maybe just a little bit of a backdrop. We've heard lots today about the, the world's population, about 7.5 billion rising to 9.5 billion. But it hasn't been a straight line growth. That's the, the way the population of the world has expanded so dramatically over a relatively short space of time. So now to put that into context in terms of where we need to be over the next 50 years, we actually need to produce more food in the next 50 years than we did in the last 500. That's what you call a global challenge. And as a backdrop to that, we are undergoing unprecedented change in our climate, <clears throat> more and more catastrophic weather events. Within my institute, we plot uh, and, and, and analyze the data from crop failures that are happening from many, many different parts of the world. And it happens on a weekly basis. There are some areas of the world that are being farmed now that will not be farmable in 20, 30, 40 years' time. We also live in an incredibly polluted planet. We've done a fantastic job as mankind in polluting our environment. So another statistic is, within the next 10 years, without some significant interventions, the weight of plastic in our oceans will be heavier than the weight of fish. And now I'll talk about the real problems. Because currently the world is about one third of the world's territory is in water deficit, fresh water deficit. And in, in a very short space of time, 2025, that's predicted to rise to two thirds water deficit. Are you really cheered up now? Because over the past several hundred years, through the globalization of food, we have developed this, the world's food web. Unbelievably complicated way that we set out and strive to feed seven and a half billion people. It has become more and more complicated, more complexities. And with every additional complexity comes another vulnerability. Lots of different types of vulnerabilities that, that I will mention later on. And, and as systems become more vulnerable, they start to lose integrity. And I'm going to talk about food integrity, but I have to start with talking about food security because we hear lots and lots about food security. The actual definition for food security, which is all on the slide, uh, came about in 1998 at the United Nations World Food Summit. And I think it stood us in very good uh, 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 ways over the, the last 20 years. But I think there, there are some aspects around food security that are actually missing in this definition. So now I'm going to produce the definition of food integrity. This is not the United Nations definition of food integrity. This is the Chris Elliott one. Now, I, I spent quite a lot of time writing this definition and I did send it to the United Nations. They just haven't replied yet. Well, actually, joking apart, we are through Codex now starting to try to define what food integrity really is. And this is the first working definition, and it will go through a very long process of engagement with 150 plus member countries to think about what food integrity is and how we try to meet the challenges that that faces now and, and more so in the future. So from this definition, I've come up with what I call it the six principles of food integrity. And I'm quite sure if you hear me talking in six months, a year, or, or two years' time, the, the, there might be seven, there might be five. The, the principles might, might change. But this is really a, a, a piece of, of, of work that, that uh, uh, will, will take quite a long time to really think through. So I, I think about food integrity as the food that we eat is safe, the food that we eat is authentic, the food that we eat is nutritious. The systems used to produce the food are sustainable, 
our food is produced to the highest ethical standards, and we respect the environment and all those who work in our food industry. Now, quite a lot of those things, those, those principles have been talked about in different ways today. And what I want to do over the next 15 minutes or so is just gently walk through these principles, show you some examples of how they are being challenged at the moment, and give you some examples of how science can give us solutions going forward. So in terms of the food that we eat is safe. So we'll start at home. Food Standards Agency estimate about one million UK citizens suffer some form of food illness each year. And about 500 people die from that. If we compare that to the United States, the Centre for Disease Control in the US estimate 48 million Americans suffer food poisoning each year. 128,000 of those are hospitalised and about 3,000 deaths. So in our post-Brexit days, when you start to think about comparing food safety systems, there, there's concern there. But then I start to think about, what about Africa? The 50 plus countries of Africa, I cannot collate the statistics to tell you those because they're not there, because there aren't food safety systems in place. But what I can tell you is that tens of millions of children in Africa suffer from stunted growth. Millions of people in sub-Saharan Africa are suffering from cancer. Those people will have short lifespans because of unsafe food. How can you have a, food in, a system based on integrity when millions of people are dying from unsafe food? And most of those problems come from natural causes, from mycotoxins, mycotoxins getting into the grains, of, 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 the, of the food that people eat. Now, just uh, two weeks ago, I was reviewing a PhD chapter from one of my Somalian students, and he had uh, obtained some samples from Mogadishu, from the market in Mogadishu, and we analyzed those samples for mycotoxins. And we found, on average, the amount of mycotoxins present in those samples were 100 times higher than what's deemed safe in Europe. So massive challenges globally in terms of, of food safety, particularly in the developing world. So what do we do about that? So as an educationalist, I come from a university, but what we have to really think about is educating children about not only food safety, but food science, because there's a total disconnect between young people where their food comes from. And we are starting I think small pockets of programs across the UK in terms of trying to reintroduce food hygiene education to children. But I think we have to think about that on a, on a national level. Now there's many scientific innovations coming along in food safety. So this is one, one example I will give you is in food packaging materials. And now there's work in, in different parts of the world, in, including my own university, in putting bioactive peptides inside the membranes of food packaging, which will actually kill the, the pathogenic bacteria that's present. And we think that's something that will be very acceptable to consumers. But now I have, to, I have two different symbols on, on the slide. The one on, on my right and your left on the one beside it are act exactly the same thing because they talk about irradiation of food. Now, if you ask people, would, are you happy with the radiation of food, the vast majority of people will say no because it's about radioactivity, and it's not. We had lots of discussions and debates in Europe in the 1980s about irradiation of food, and it was decided that it was not something that we would pursue. The technology has moved on in, in, in many, many ways, and, and parts of the world are now using food irradiation, and I think what we need to do is have a national debate whether we use what I call low energy means of making food safer. So if you think that's a little bit controversial, now I'm going to talk about GM. Now, one, one set of the corn is, is a GM variety, and, and one is a conventional. And you can see one set is heavily contaminated with fungi, 
and those are the fungi that produce the mycotoxins that kill people. We haven't accepted GM for, for, for many, many reasons. And I think it's now time to start to re-examine all of the scientific evidence to determine the future of GM. Michael Gove this morning started to talk about gene editing techniques. We really start to think about in terms of making food safer for the world, in terms of how we're going to deal with, with advances in, in, in crop technology. So I'm going to move on now to the next principle is around, around our food being authentic. And this is really the, 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 the area of food fraud. So I've been working on it for, for a long time. And, and what becomes very apparent to me is that it's becoming much more internationalized. It's becoming, um, um, uh, crime gangs are, be are becoming involved in different parts of the world. Mafia is taking over parts of the food industry in, in, in Italy. And that's because you can make more money out of crime in food than you can in narcotics. This is something that's not going to go away. <coughs> now, what, what the impacts of food fraud? So I take organic food as an example. Lots of effort goes into producing organic food. Those people tend to be incredibly passionate about what they do. And how fraud can start to destroy entire sectors of the industry. So last week I was reading an article in a United States newspaper and it gave 10 tips how to spot fake organic food. Now, when you start to see that in newspapers, people start to lose trust. You think, why should I really bother buying this? So the, the impact of fraudsters on, on whole sectors of, of, of agriculture and food are enormous. But my, I, I'm a professor of food safety, so I, I tend to concentrate on those things that have an impact on human health. And what I picked up over the last few years is more and more cases of issues around nuts getting into the food supply system, powdered nuts. People have died in the UK from, from powdered nuts being used to, to substitute for higher value products and, and things like cumin and, and, and uh, um, um, almond powders. And, and probably even more alarming is, not sure if there's any experts, fish experts in, in the audience, but that is called an escalor. Anybody has ever heard of an escalor? Put your hand up. No fish experts. So an escalor is actually quite similar to a tuna. Looks a bit like a tuna, tastes very much like a tuna. The only problem with an escalor is it contains a particular wax that when you consume it, you feel quite ill, usually 24, 48 hours after you consume that. Now, I tell you about Escalor is because in the United States, more and more of the surveys that are done in tuna shows that people aren't actually eating tuna, they're eating Escalor. Two days ago, I had some data from, from China, from one region of China, and it wasn't Escalor that they were eating there, it was puffer fish, one of the world's most deadly species, and people were dying from fraud around species substitution. And I could, I could fill the slide with many, many different examples where fraud will impact the, the well-being of people and, and can kill. So in terms of what do we do about this um, global trade in, in illegal food products, I think one of the biggest scientific inventions, I think, or, or, or innovations over the past number of years is the ability to fingerprint foods. So what we do is we look at foodstuffs, food commodities, and we produce molecular fingerprints. And those molecular fingerprints can be very, very complex. We can measure 5,000, 10,000 different attributes to any type of food commodity. And we can compare those fingerprints with things that are on sale on the markets or coming across supply chains to make sure they're, they're authentic. And we're now moving to the steps where we're taking this type of analysis out of the laboratory and we're using smartphones. So here we have a little device on the end of the guy's fingers with a smartphone and within five seconds you can scan the food commodity. It will send the, the data to the cloud, compare that fingerprint with the fingerprint stored in the cloud and within five seconds you'll know whether it's genuine or fake. And what we're currently doing now is we're mapping all of the rice varieties around, around the world to produce molecular fingerprints to try to reduce the amount of fraud in that uh, 
particular food commodity. There was a lot of discussions this morning about the, the impacts of digital technologies, and certainly digital technologies in tracking and tracing of foods is an exploding area of, of, of innovation, particularly the use of blockchain. So blockchain can track financial transactions that happen, very complex financial transactions. We're now using blockchain technology to track where food is going across the world. So if you can track where it's going and you can track the molecular structure, it makes it much, much more difficult to cheat. So then onto the, uh, the, the principle around nutrition. And we, we have heard lots of discussions about nutrition today and uh, how, uh, how that what we sell in the UK is, is, is top of the range and top quality. Now, from this, you can probably tell I'm not a mathematical genius. This is my type of, of, of equation, one plus two plus two. The one refers to nearly one billion people on our planet who are undernourished. The two is the two billion people who are overnourished. So we have no more overnourished people than undernourished. And for the first time, we believe in the history of our planet, we have now more overweight children than underweight children. Can you think of the health consequences for those kids as they, as they grow up? And what's the final two? And the final two is around what's called hidden hunger. And hidden hunger is you think that you're eating a healthy, nutritious diet, but you're not, because the food is missing some vital micronutrients, trace metals, fatty acids, fat-soluble vitamins. So there are now estimated two billion people in the world who think they're getting a healthy diet, aren't. So if you put that together, one plus two plus two, that's five out of the current world's population, 7.5 billion people have some nutritional issues. That's not a system based on integrity. So in terms of what can we do in terms of the challenges around nutrition, and again, I've been really buoyed because lots of, of the presentations that I've heard today have talked about soil. And that's where we have to start in thinking about changing the chemistry of the soil, changing the, the nutrients that are present in the soil, not for the benefit of the plants, but for the benefit of us, the consumers, at the end of the day. And there are now many interventions going on in different parts of the world in really rethinking soil science. And we've got to do the same thing for the feeds that goes into animals. We've got to think about boosting those with the, with the omegas, with, with the fat-soluble vitamins and, and, and the uh, trace metals that are absolutely essential for, for, for a healthy well-being. And then I go back to education. We have really got to reconnect our, our, our young population in terms of healthy eating, in terms of eating the right micronutrients. So the next principle is around sustainability, and there was lots of discussions already about, about sustainability. Uh, the, the first example I would like to use is water, because I talked about the, the shortage of water in different parts of the world. So the example I like to use is California. California is the fifth biggest area, the fifth biggest food producer in the world. 50% of all the fruit and veg that are consumed in the United States come from California. It's a colossal industry, yet California is in massive water deficit. Its agriculture systems are not sustainable. And when I think about California, I then drill down to think about um, almonds. Over 80% of the world's almonds are grown in California. And if you think every time you eat an almond, it took one gallon of water. It's not sustainable. But also in terms of sustainability, we've got to think closer to home and all of those inputs that goes into the farms in terms of our fertilizers and so forth, the world is running short of lots and lots of materials. And we've got to think about 
different agricultural systems that can still grow crops in a healthy way, but do not need that level of intervention. Again, I was really pleased to hear lots in terms of, of, of biodiversity, the importance of biodiversity. And the examples that I gave are the, are the dwindling population of bees in the world and, and the link with the use of pesticides. And here we have a massive conflict in terms of, of food security and, and, and biodiversity. There are massive challenges ahead in terms of what, what is the right thing to do in terms of sustainability of our planet. So in terms of some of the interventions is, again, we go back to soil. We've really got to think about the chemistry of soil, how we're going to deal with soil going forward. That six inches of soil that, that, that protect us from, from, from the world going hungry. There was lots of, of fantastic presentations about technologies on farm, smart agriculture. And, and we've got smart agriculture, we've got climate smart agriculture. There, there's growing knowledge about how to deal with some of the dramatic shortages that we have in terms of water and, and, and other, uh, other inputs. There was also a huge amount of discussion this morning about subsidies. What is it that farm subsidies should go into? Now, my personal view is farmers are the custodian of, of, of the land. That's very, very important. But we've also got to think about the long-term sustainability of food production. That's where we need to put our, 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 our public money into. The subject of food ethics, I mean, it's a topic, a very complex topic in itself. Because some people who, who, who are, are, are great believers in food ethics think thinks we should not eat animals at all because of the, the carbon footprint and, and greenhouse gases and so forth. But I like to think of ethics in terms of we do some things very, very well in the UK and we've talked about the high animal welfare standards. We're, we're now moving into the, the, the post-Brexit era where we will be dealing with people who operate at different standards. This isn't about the economy, the economics of this. We've got to think about the ethics. Do we really want to start to buy food from, from agriculture and food industries that do not respect animals? Also think about the, the use of pesticides and insecticides. Lots of these chemicals which have a long-term detrimental effect to, to our health. Again, another conundrum that we have to face. How, how can you be profitable and, and not use these, these agrochemicals? There, there, there's major ethical issues around those. The third example I have is the use of antibiotics. So it's calculated that 50% of all the antibiotics produced in the world are used in farm animal production. Yet one of our great public health issues is around antimicrobial resistance. So how can we reduce the amount of antibiotics that are used in farm animal production, but still maintain the health, maintain the, the welfare of those animals? Very complex. In terms of um, the, the, the last point I wanted to make is around ethics is the politics of food. And, and, and that's really about cheap food. Is it something that we should strive for, is to keep the prices of food low? Because many governments across the world absolutely think that's the right thing to do. It's about affordability and availability of food. But at what cost? And again, a huge ethical debate, debate around the price of cheap food. So back to a little bit of science now. So here's a, 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 what's called a chemometric map. And what that is, is those molecular fingerprints that I talked about. And, and we, we produce these molecular fingerprints. We produce very complex algorithms. And then we can do three-dimensional plots. So this is actually a, a chemometric model of shrimps. So what I can tell is each of those colors of shrimps are different species produced in different parts of the world. 
We can do that through the molecular modeling. But now what we're setting out to do is, can we produce the same models, the same chemometric models to tell how animals have been treated on the farm? High welfare standards, low welfare standards. Because I think as we go forward, we need scientific tools to prove how animals have been treated on the farms. Huge amount of work on diagnostics, diagnostic tools for the early detection of disease. And again, I think there, there, there's a great combination in thinking about the drive towards earlier detection of disease and farm profitability. I don't see any great conflicts there. And again, we had some fantastic uh, um, discussions and, and presentations around the use of sensor technologies, around the individual animal, animal monitoring. How much is the animal eating? What's its temperature? Huge amounts of information that you can get from implanting sensors into animals. And many people think, well, what's that got to do with ethics? Well, it's about looking after animals properly. It's about early detection of issues and dealing with those, those issues. Again, the use of drone technology has been, has been mentioned. And the drone technology was mentioned about reducing costs. To my mind, the use of drones is about reducing the amount of insecticides, pesticides that have to be used through smart technologies. So again, there's no great conflict there. If we can think about using drone technology, it will have many, many different attributes across the food supply system. So the last of the, of the, the principles is about respect, respecting the environment and, and, and those who work in our food industry. So in terms of respecting our environment, I, I will often use palm oil as the example. Massive swathes of, of forest land uh, uh, across the world being destroyed for palm oil production, yet it employs millions and millions of, of people. The palm oil industry itself claims to be 20% sustainable. I don't think that's a, that's a great badge for any industry to have. So massive issues in terms of thinking about long-term sustainability and, and, and is palm oil the right thing to do in terms of, of, of so many food products that it goes into? We've also talked about living wage. We saw in one of the video clips a farmer saying is, I, I, I can basically just about afford to live. That's not a food system based on integrity. I also read an article recently where some people who work in fast food uh, um, outlets in the UK, once they finish work, they then join the queues of food banks. That's not a system based on, on respect for those people who work in, in the food industries. So I have two maps here, the one on your left and the one on your right. The one on the left is where most of the food is produced in the world, the major agricultural regions. The map on the right is where most of modern day slavery happens in the world. Look at the overlap. So we have huge numbers of people in, captured in slavery, working in primary agriculture in many different parts of the world. And it gets worse. Because there's many, many cases, many issues about child labor in many of the different primary agriculture industries in the world. Harvesting coconuts, processing cocoa for chocolate, shit shelling shrimps. Just three examples. Now, a lot of those examples I've given you are from far away places, but here's a map, and this map was produced by Professor Tim Benton from Leeds University, our former global food security champion. That is a map of where all the food that is imported into the UK comes from. We get food from everywhere, every corner of the earth. So think about that nice lunch we had today. How much of that lunch, how many of the ingredients had some form of modern day slavery or child labor implicated? It's a scary thought. So what do we do about this? Now, lots of industries are now thinking about here are guidelines in terms of sustainability, in terms of ethical sourcing. We can start to use the, the ability to digitally map supply chains and, and try to find out where food comes from. But from my own experience, that's not enough. 
And, and what I have not been able to do is to find a scientific solution to how we deal with issues around slavery and child labor. That's something for the, for the world to tackle. Now, I think one of the, the questions that went to the last panel was about a brand. What about a, a food brand for the UK based on integrity? Now, a food brand based on integrity, the first question you have to think about for all of those different attributes in terms of what integrity means, how many of those boxes could we actually tick as a nation? And I think it's quite a number of them. But there would still need to be a huge number of fundamental changes in how we produce food, how, how we sell food. And then the last question is, could the UK agriculture and food industry work with government to deliver? So I listened very carefully to Michael Gove this morning, and a lot of what he talked about was about integrity. Can we deliver that? So I think the message was absolutely right. The big problem was how to deliver it. But a quote from Mark Twain is, it's never wrong to do the right thing. So what I'm going to finish with now is talk about the hub for global food integrity. So this is something I've been talking about for, for quite a long time and, and traveling the world and trying to enlist support. And it's about bringing science, natural sciences, social sciences, engineers, lawyers together, thinking about how to deal with the issues of global food integrity. I'm now working with people in China, in India, in many different parts of the world in thinking about what this global hub will set out to do and will, what will achieve. And I hope maybe a small number of you in the audience will have some thoughts about how you might want to join a global hub. And with that, I'll thank you for your attention. Thank you.